Hello everybody, welcome to Comparative Animal Physiology. My name is Dr. Horman and I will be the one narrating and helping you through um, this course during the next few weeks. Now before we get into our first audio lecture on chapter one, I do want to point out that you can find a copy of the PowerPoint you'll be looking at um, downloaded for you on Canvas. And I've also downloaded the PDF file of the chapter for the textbook that we'll be utilizing. Um, what I would highly recommend is you take your time and you work your way through the video. Make sure that you take your notes. Um, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, don't be shy. Feel free to email me or post them in the discussion sessions. If you would like to do some more reading, definitely utilize that PDF file with the textbook chapter. And the reason I want you to do all this is because our exams that we'll be taking in our course will be based on questions that I write myself, which are going to be based on the audio lectures and the PowerPoints. So if you find yourself being a little confused or wanting some more details about items, definitely utilize all your resources, including myself. I am here to assist along the way. So any questions, comments, concerns, don't hesitate me. Go ahead and just send me that email and I will get back to you as soon as possible. So without further ado, let's go ahead and take a look at chapter one. This is Introduction to Physiological Principles. And as many first chapters in textbooks, it's a nice little intro chapter that'll take a look at some of the common key terms and themes that we'll come across as we start perusing through the course. All right, so first things first, what exactly is physiology? Well, many of us might have taken an anatomy and physiology class before. And when we did that, we learned that anatomy is when we focus on the shape or the structure, whereas physiology is gonna take a look at how exactly this item works. So how is the structure related to the function? Well, in our comparative animal physiology, we're gonna take that a step above. We're gonna take that anatomy and physiology, the form versus the function, and we're not only gonna take a look at it, how it happens in humans, but we're also gonna start comparing it across a wide array of different animal and species models. So this is a very interesting class, and I think you'll have some fun, and you'll definitely learn some new things as we go through our next six weeks. Now, part of what you're going to notice is that there's lots of diversity. We obviously know that. There's over a million species on Earth alone that we've been able to identify thus far, and every day more come along. But we also see that there are some unifying themes that all of these living entities will tend to share. So part of what Chapter 1 we'll take a look at will be these themes. So what are some of the physical and chemical laws that living entities tend to follow or abide by? What is homeostasis? Why is it important? What is a genotype and how does it relate to the phenotype? And of course, how do evolutionary changes contribute to species and the mark that they leave on the world? So let's go ahead and before we get into those themes a little bit more, um, let's take, go back down memory lane and let's take a look at some of the scientists whose work have contributed to most of the knowledge that we have for physiology. All right, we're gonna take it all the way back to Hippocrates. Hippocrates is known as the father of medicine. And the reason that he's on this list of famous scientists and researchers is because he was one of the first ones to say, you know what, don't just accept what's being told to you. Don't just accept the regular dogma. To go ahead and do your own investigation. Question the knowledge that's presented to you. Go ahead and make observations and make notations. Um, so for instance, he was very big on the fact that if a person became ill, to kind of investigate what exactly caused it. You know, did the person get injured? Did they have a bacterial infection? He wasn't one to just say, well, you know, your knee hurts because it's a Thursday and the weather looks like it's going to rain. He actually wanted to know what was causing it. Um, Gallen was another scientist that was very instrumental to the start or the base workings of physiology. Gallen was our first experimental physiologist. He worked during the time of the gladiators and he was able to look at the human body when it was injured as well as the different animal research and he came up with a lot of interesting findings. Um, for instance, some of his work um, was the starting point of the relationship between the ureter 
kidney and urine formation. He would tie up the ureter in different animal species and he would notice how the kidney would start to swell. So he was one of the first physiologists to say, hey, that liquid and that tubing is related um, and of laying the groundwork for the urinary system. Um, he also had an experiment that he did or a concept that he spoke about in many of his writings and books um, about the circulatory system. And I always found it very interesting because it was completely wrong, but it was a very interesting explanation. He said one of the main reasons why we need to consume food on a daily basis is because your food molecules are converted into blood cells. And these blood cells will then roam your body, and as they encounter your different organs, the organs will consume the blood. And that is then how the organs will be able to survive and thrive and keep the body healthy. So basically, Gallen said that when you sit down for your breakfast, your Cheerios that you ate this morning, they have been converted into red blood cells right now, and they're on their way to your liver and your kidney to be consumed. So don't forget to have lunch and dinner because we're gonna have to repeat that process all over again because the red blood cells are disappearing as they're being consumed by your organs. It sounds a little out of the world, but hey, listen, he did this experiment and this is what he thought he observed. And in fact, it wasn't until the 1500s, or actually the 1600s, I should say, when William Harvey came around with his research that said, you know, Gallen um, had some good ideas, but he was very wrong when it came to the circulatory system. No, when you consume your food, it does not become a red blood cell. And no, your organs do not consume it. Um, but instead, what he talked about is the fact that the digestive system will concentrate on getting nutrients to the body, whereas the circulatory system will utilize your arteries and your veins and use that as a transporting mechanism for your red blood cells and your white blood cells to float around doing things like gas exchange and providing immunity. Um, Harvey was also one that stipulated that there had to be some type of blood vessel that connected arteries and veins, and those, of course, are the capillaries. He wasn't able to physically see them, but he stipulated that they just had to be there. So this just kind of shows you how when you do research and you collect data and you investigate, you might not always have the correct answer, but it does open the way for different discussions and obviously um, different methods of learning exactly how an organism or how a system works. Oh, I seem to forget about Vesalius. Vesalius was one of the first to actually create what we call a modern anatomy textbook. Um, and this meant that when he illustrated the human body, for instance, when he took a look at muscles, he took his time and drew all the small little details, all the different fibers and the striations. Um, his drawings are still being utilized today, and they're often credited if you go ahead and you get yourself a nice anatomy textbook, if you want to learn more about the individual breakdown of like the skin, the muscles, and the bones. It is all based on some of the initial drawings that Vesalius initiated in his textbook. Another few scientists that I definitely want to mention are Sliden and Swan. They were the ones that are credited with forming the cell theory. So based on their research, they basically stipulated that the cell is the functioning unit of life. All organisms are composed of at least one or more cells. And the third tenet of the cell theory came along a little bit later. It was aided by the discovery of the microscope. And it basically said that all cells come from pre-existing cells. Bernard and Cannon, their work collectively led to the term homeostasis. Um, Bernard went ahead and did experiments where he wanted to see how our internal environment, so things like our temperature, would be affected if we were exposed to different um, extreme environments. So what would happen if you have extreme heat exposure or you're put in an environment that's severely, that's very cold? How does your body respond to it? And in his papers, he wrote about milieu interior, which means your internal environment. And based on his um, work, we saw that Cannon continued that type of research and was able to actually coin the term homeostasis. For many of us, we've seen that term before, and if you were to ask for a definition, a lot of us would say, 
Well, homeostasis is sort of like internal consistency. And you're completely correct in that. It is all the different ways that our body will regulate things like our internal temperature, our internal pH, regardless of the environment that we're placed in. And we know that homeostasis is essential because it allows the organs not only to thrive and function at maximum capacity, it is also important for the overall well-being of the body. Um, the last one on our list is Prother. Prother's work helped us with developing a knowledge of CPGs. These are central pattern generators. Um, they are a group of neurons that will simultaneously fire off, and when they fire off, they will create rhythmic behaviors. So one of those behaviors is what you see in the little animation. It is the movement of the gait the swinging of the legs as you go forwards, backwards, forwards, backwards. Um, the other pattern that he was talking about would be the relationship between the diaphragm and the lungs. The fact that when the diaphragms contract and uh, relax, they assist the lungs in changing their volume, which we utilize for our inhaling and our exhaling pattern. So Prother was very essential to getting us to know about our central pattern generators. Now, as we peruse through our different chapters, you're going to notice that oftentimes you'll encounter different branches of physiology. And part of that is because if you want to really know the full story, you're going to have to start by looking at the smaller parts of it. So on this PowerPoint, it takes a look at the different branches of physiologists that are out there. Um, so for instance, at the smallest level, we could start from a molecular aspect, um, seeing how the actual cells interact. We're looking at cellular and molecular physiology. This one is very interested in the genetics, so the DNA, the genome, how many chromosomes, um, the actual workings of the cell, so what type of organelles do they have, um, how are they able to metabolize their nutrients and energy demands. Um, well, that is all pertained within cellular and molecular physiology. If you want to take it a step further and see how do these cells interact and how do they form tissues and how do these tissues now correspond to different organ systems, then you go into systems physiology. And as you can see on the PowerPoint, I just wrote down for you, that's when you really function or when you focus on the function of individual organs. So, you know, what do the lungs contribute? Um, how does the sensory system correspond with the integumentary system? And as you start to learn more about the systems, we can obviously put that all together to see how the entire animal functions. And that would then be the organism of physiology that you see listed third on the PowerPoint slides. The last two items are going to be more interested in seeing how the organism is able to interact with its environment, um, as well as with different species. So for instance, you can take a look at ecological physiology. We do a lot of that at FAU in our environmental sciences, where we want to see how animals are adapting um, or utilizing their particular environment. So if something comes along like a severe drought or um, a Category 5 hurricane, how does that affect <coughs> things like the food supply and the amount of nutrients that the animal can have exposure to. And if you put all this together and you want to take a look from small to large, interacting with environment or even comparing different organisms, then what we have is a nice collection of integrated physiology. That is just combining all these different levels together. And as we gain our knowledge, you're going to notice that the way we can study our processes can usually be divided um, by two different levels. You can have what we call reductionism, which is that you understand a system by studying the functions of the individual parts. So you basically start large and you work your way through smaller parts. So if you want to know how the body works, you would start by taking a look at the integumentary system. Then you would take a look at the respiratory system the cardiovascular system, the digestive system, the reproductive systems, and you work your way through. Or for instance, if you're interested in knowing all the muscles in the human body, um, some of you might go ahead and print out a picture of the entire body with all the muscles and basically start working at them in smaller parts, starting, for instance, with the frontalis muscle that makes up our forehead and working our way through all the facial muscles before we work our way down the entire body. So reductionism is all about breaking it down into smaller parts.
Um, emergency is more about what we call discovering emergent properties. Emergent properties basically says that the sum of the individual parts is greater than the whole. So what's best to do is if you really want to learn how an organism functions is go ahead and start studying small little pieces of it and start putting the pieces together to see how they all fit. So for instance, if you want to learn about blood vessels, you might want to take a look at what actually makes up a blood vessel, what type of cells are involved. Um, so I'll give you, for instance, an example. Let's say if you study your um, epithelium cells. Epithelium cells are your skin cells. What we see happening is that the growth pattern of epithelium cells will initially be flat, and as they become more numerous, they're going to start coiling up into these tube-like structures. These tubes, as they become more and more complex and gain more and more cells, they will have a higher function in the human body. In fact, they'll often contribute to things like our blood vessels. So our body can utilize it for the movement of our red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. So an emergent property basically says that if you put all the little pieces together, you get an item that's larger, more complex, and more beneficial to the overall organism or to the body itself. Um, anytime, for instance, and this is kind of taking it away from science, but if you're into cooking or baking, anytime you do something like that, you're doing an emergent properties where you're taking individual ingredients and you're combining them to make something that is more beneficial, more nutritious, and definitely more delicious than the individual pieces. So go ahead and take a look at this table. This is table 1.1, and this basically highlights the unifying themes that I was mentioning to you before um, as we started chit-chatting about the chapter. And what I want to do is I want to take a few minutes and take a look at these four items. So regardless of what animal model we're going to be looking at, we're going to see that there will always be some loss of physics and chemistry or chemical laws that we should be following. And as you can see on the side right here, there are some examples. So for instance, the chemical laws can include the effects of temperature, um, how the molecules interact together. So for instance, do you have your hydrogen bonds? Are you having your covalent bonds? Um, your electrical laws would be, for instance, if we take a look at things like action potential, resting membrane potential, um, depolarization, repolarization. We're also going to take a look at how body size can affect physiological processes. Um, beyond that, we're also going to take a look at some of the physiological processes that are usually regulated. Haha! -ha. And whenever we see the term regulated, we're going to have to talk about homeostasis. So that internal consistency and how the body will tend to use feedback systems like negative and positive feedback systems to maintain that overall homeostasis. Um, the third item will be to do a comparison between genotype and phenotype. Genotype obviously is a collection of all your genes, your DNA, your chromosomes. Well, how does that DNA that you inherit from your parents correlate to our overall physical and behavioral attributes that we see in our phenotype? And does the environment play a role in that as well? And last but not least, we're going to take a look at the evolutionary processes. And this will go ahead and take things like genotype and phenotype and talk about the fact how they allow us to form adaptations, which often will correlate to how successful we are in engaging with our environment. And the more successful we are, the more things like natural selection will play in our favor. Um, survival of the fittest will have an easier time finding a mate. And if you have an easy time finding a mate, according to science, you should have no problem reproducing and producing lots and lots of offspring. So how does the DNA differ from the offspring? And how does that contribute to the overall changes that we see as we follow evolutionary trends in different species? All right, so let's dive right into the first one, right? So let's take a look at some of these chemical and physical laws that all organisms have to abide by. And part of this is going to have to do with things like um, molecular interactions. We know that we're made out of molecules. So how are these molecules all coming together? And what we see happening is that regardless of um, how complex or how simple an organism is, there will always be things like thermodynamics and kinetics that will play a role in it. And this all has to pertain to the fact that every living entity will require energy to be successful in life. 
And thermodynamics and kinetics take a look at that energy. They take a look at things like the utilization of kinetic energy, um, um, which is your energy of motion. We also see that we have energy that we get from the foods that we're consuming. But we also know that you can neither create nor destroy energy, right? You simply convert it from one item to the next. So how does our body do things like endergonic and exergonic reactions, where it's building and pulling apart molecules so that we can transfer these chemical energies, um, such as ATP, and use that to function from a day-to-day -day aspect? We also see that within these physical and chemical laws, we have to talk about the fact that since all cells have a plasma membrane, some of them go a step above and are able to create an electrical gradient across that uh, boundary of the cell. And as they're creating that electrical gradient, they can create a resting membrane potential, meaning that we can manipulate the charge that's happening on the membrane so we can excite the cell. So when we start taking a look at things like muscles and nerves, we're going to have to discuss action potentials and how when we manipulate the membrane voltage that the cell will often respond. So for instance, in muscles, it will cause the contraction of the muscle to occur. And then something also that you'll see when you do your physical and chemical analysis is that oftentimes you'll see a correlation between um, the inner and the outer size of the cell. And that all has to do with the fact that cells tend to function best when they are relatively small. And when you do that, you want to think about things like um, surface area and volume. All right, so let me give you an example. Now, one thing you're going to notice very quickly about me is that my drawing abilities are non-existing, so bear with me, okay? So here's my tiny little cell. I know, mind blown, that was a perfect circle. <laughs> no, that really. <laughs> All right, so here's my larger cell. So let's say, for instance, we're looking at a cell, and if you don't wanna do a cell, that's fine. We can do, for instance, uh, let's do a comparison of a tennis ball versus a basketball, okay? Most of us know what those two items look like, and we know that one is significantly smaller than the other, okay? So when you look at an object such as this and you compare that to a cell, the reason you're doing that is because we discussed the fact that according to the cell theory, the cell is a living entity, which means that it will have nutritional demands and it will have waste products that it has to kind of get out of its system to maintain its homeostasis and all that other good stuff. Well, what that means for the cell is that it's going to have to take a look at what we call its surface area. S-A, oh, Lord. Surface area versus its volume. Okay, you guys just forgive me with this. Me and my mouse are not working along today. Here we go. So when it comes to the cell, we have to take a look at the surface area versus the volume. The surface area is going to be the outside of the cell. This is going to be the cell's membrane. It's important because this will be your mechanism that you'll utilize to get stuff in and out of the cell. The volume is going to be the internal area of the cell. The volume will determine how many nutritional demands you have and how much waste products you have to get rid of. And what we see happening is that these two items, the surface area on the outside and the volume on the inside, they do not correlate when it comes to going from a small to a large cell. What do I mean with that? Well, it turns out that when you increase the size of the cell, so when we get upgraded from a tennis ball to a basketball, I think most of us will be comfortable in saying, okay, well, the basketball is larger, so it will have a larger volume on the inside, and it will have a larger surface area on the outside. Well, what we see happening is, as we take a cell and we enlarge it, yes, just like the basketball, the volume gets larger on the inside, the surface area gets larger on the outside. But it turns out that the volume gets larger at an increasingly larger rate than the surface area which means that as the cell starts to grow, its internal demands of nutrient and waste accumulation increases exponentially faster than the surface area can keep up with. So a larger cell is not as effective in maintaining its homeostasis because it simply doesn't have enough surface area to maintain its nutritional and its waste demands. So the best thing to do is to keep the cell nice and small. Now your body does figure out some ways to kind of get around this. One of these is for instance, the utilizations of um, pseudopods, which is that you can take your plasma membrane, your cell membrane, and kind of maneuver it and change the shape. And as you're stretching it out, you're increasing your interaction 
with your environment. Um, the other thing is, for instance, what our neurons do, in that you have a larger cell, but the cell is very flat. And when a cell is flat, you have lots of surface area on the outside, and you have minimum volume on the inside that needs to be maintained. So there are some ways to kind of get around that relationship of volume to surface area. But this also explains to you why a lot of the cells you see will be small, and it's very rare to come across a very large plump cell. And that's just simply because of the volume to surface area relationship. And in fact, in um, our chapter, chapter one, it kind of correlates the story of volume to surface area, but it discusses it along the way of the allometric scale. The allometric scale takes a look at the metab um, metabolic, metabolic rate, excuse me guys, the metabolic rate of an organism and how that correlates with its overall body size. And what we see happening is, as an organism gets larger, Obviously, it will start generating more heat. This heat is produced by the metabolism of the different tissues. And the more tissues you have, the higher your metabolic rate is, which means the more heat you generate. And the heat has to be dispensed out of the body through the utilization of the surface area, starting from the smallest level at the cell membrane and at the largest level on our skin. So allometric scaling says, well, what we would expect is the larger the entity is, the larger the mass, the higher the metabolic rate, which means the more heat is generated. But it turns out that it's not a proportional increase. So if you take a look at your scale, you're going to notice that right here it says that your overall metabolic rate is going to be equal indeed to your body mass. Okay, this is true. But in order to make sure that we properly align those two, we're gonna have to add not only a scaling coefficient, but also a normalization coefficient. And the scaling coefficient is the one that we're kind of talking about right now when we were looking at my very detailed drawing of the cells right over here. It corresponds to the fact that as the organism gets larger, the inside and the outside do not proportionally increase. So the volume gets exponentially larger, but the surface area can't keep up with the demands of the overall cell. Now let's go ahead and take a look at a chart for this and see if we can kind of see where we'll our prediction would be versus where our um, allometric scaling will come into play with the utilization of the coefficients. All right, so take a look at this little chart right here. We're looking at metabolic rate and we're looking at body mass. Okay, so basically we're just increasing in size and you can see there's different animals. We're taking a look at a mouse, a bird, a rat, a chimpanzee, there's a human, and then towards the top of it we have elephants. The larger you go up the scale, right? Now, we would expect that there would be a one-to-one -one ratio. When you increase the body mass, you'll increase the, the metabolic rate, and it will all be corresponding together. Um, however, we see that it's not necessarily true. What do I mean with that? Well, we would expect that if something is 10 times as larger, it would have 10 times as much or fast metabolic rate, right? Unfortunately, what we see happening is that when we take a look, for instance, at our goose right here, its metabolic rate is not lining up to 10. Instead, it's more towards seven. And once again, my apologies for not being able to draw a straight line. And it turns out that the reason that this is true is because of the fact that we have our scaling coefficient, which says that the surface area and the volume do not proportionally increase. And here we have our line of unity, which shows what the relationship that we would expect. And in red is our allometric scaling. And what we see happening is that by applying the scaling coefficient, we're able to better predict the heat distribution and dispersal because of the fact that we now know the relationship between the volume and the surface area is not a one-to-one -one ratio. Now, in order to maintain our homeostasis, our internal consistency, we see that organisms will often be labeled either as conformers or regulators. A conformer, as you can indicate by the name, means that it's going to conform or match 
its external in, uh, conditions. Um, a regulator, on the other hand, will often have mechanisms or systems set up that will allow the internal temperature or pH to remain consistent regardless of what environment you're in. Now, as you can guess, regulators usually require more energy to maintain their consistency, whereas with conformers, it's kind of easy to go back and forth. Each cell basically has to survive on whatever environment it's exposed to. Now, these two items are important to point out because both of them really do show a level of maintenance. And homeostasis, by definition, is the maintenance of internal conditions. And one thing I do want to point out is that homeostasis doesn't mean that you have to be at an exact set point during all parts of the day. You are able to fluctuate a little bit up and down as long as you average out around the set point. So what do I mean by that? Well, our internal body temperature is 37 degrees Celsius, uh, which is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. And what we see happening is if I were to ask all of you guys right now to take your temperature, a lot of us will not be directly at that 37 degrees Celsius, 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, does that mean that we're not in homeostasis? Nope. It just means that we're able to fluctuate a little bit. In fact, if I were to tell you, go ahead and take your temperature every two hours for the rest of the day and average it out, what you're going to see is that as you collect your data and you fluctuate slightly up and down, at the end of the day when you average, you're going to be very close to that set point because we know that our body is able to maintain homeostasis. And what will assist us with maintaining this internal consistency is the fact that we can use feedback systems. And we have a negative or a positive feedback system to choose from. So let's go ahead and let's take a look at this little picture right here. And we are looking at our homeostasis regulation of body temperature, right? So we have our normal body temperature. And what we see happening is if our body is exposed to high levels of temperatures, elevated body temperature, right? We would expect an increase. So how are we gonna go ahead and we're gonna correlate that? Well, one thing that we're gonna see happening is that our negative feedback system will allow our body to detect this change and we'll go ahead and send off signals so that we can respond and come back to homeostasis. And one of the things that our body will do when it's elevated in temperature it will go ahead and start getting rid of all that excess heat. And that would be good old fashioned sweating. As you're sweating, you're basically cooling down the body. And once the temperature is significantly uh, dropped or back to normal, we see that the sweating usually stops. On the other hand, if you're exposed to the cold and you start shivering, that is another way that your body tries to regulate temperature because cold exposure usually means that your body temperature will drop. So what your negative feedback system will do is it will activate an increase in heat production, thereby warming up the body back to normal. And the heat production is done due to shivering. Shivering is basically um, involuntary muscle contractions, which almost act like a little electrical blanket, warming the body about. Another example that you can think about, for instance, um, is just your overall regulation of body temperature. Um, it is controlled by the hypothalamus, and your hypothalamus basically is where your internal thermostat is set at. And what we see happening is if we go somewhere that it's, for instance, very cold, so let's say hopefully when all this is done, we're going to take a nice little vacation. Maybe we'll go somewhere like Aspen where the temperature is really cold. We'll go do some skiing and snowboarding. Why not? All right, well, when we get there, our body's going to notice that we're in an environment that's a lot colder than we're used to, and our body is going to need to have a lot of body heat to kind of maintain that consistency, right? So we're going to find ourselves shivering a lot. But we can't shiver um, on the long term. So instead, what we see happening is that the hypothalamus will detect this change in external environment, and then will send a signal over to your thyroid and your thyroid will start producing thyroid hormone 
thyroid hormone has metabolic effects. So it will cause you to start craving more carbohydrates. So you're going to notice you're hungry. And as you're hungry, you often go and you get yourself some food. And that food is then quickly broken down by our digestive system. And as it's breaking down that excess food, it's also generating more body heat. And that body heat can be used to warm you on a larger scale. And when the hypothalamus notices that you now have enough body heat to be okay in this cold environment, it goes ahead and it shuts off its distress signal and your body maintains its homeostasis. This is a perfect example of a negative feedback system because in a negative feedback system, you basically only work until you have the result and then the stimulus goes away. Um, if you don't like my example of body temperature, um, we can do another example of one that we're pretty much familiar with, which is the AC in our house, right? So a lot of us, um, if we're not at home, um, we tend to put the AC at a little bit of a higher point because we don't need, you know, to make FPL any richer. We don't need to be the house to be nice and cold when we're not here. And then when we come back um, at the end of the day, we walk over to the thermostat and we like to decrease the temperature so it's nice and comfortable. So for instance, in my household, um, the thermostat usually goes up to 77 when we're not in. And when we come back home later on in the day, I like to have it at 74. So you're going to notice that I will send a stimulus to the AC unit because I would like the house to be colder. So the thermostat will go ahead and turn on the AC unit. The AC unit will start pumping out cold air. And once the house is properly cooled at 74 degrees, what happens to the AC unit? It shuts off. So you basically stop working because you've received the goal that is needed for it. So in a negative feedback system, it basically says that you receive a stimulus and you keep working on it until you get to your results. And once you have your results, the stimulus goes away. Your body loves to use a negative feedback system because you basically only work a minimum amount of time to get to your product. Um, the opposite of a negative feedback system is a positive feedback system. And in a positive feedback system, what we're doing is we're doing an amplifying cycle where the stimulus will cause you to produce product. And when the product is produced, instead of the stimulus going away, you actually amplify the level of stimulus, which causes you to produce even more product. We see this, for instance, in childbirth. When a woman is ready to give uh, birth, the baby's head will start knocking on her cervix. And as it's knocking on the cervix, it's basically sending a signal to the brain saying, go ahead and start contracting the uterine muscles because I would like to come out, right? So as it's knocking, the brain releases this hormone called oxytocin. Oxytocin travels over to the uterine muscles and causes them to contract. If there was a negative feedback system, then the minute it contracted, the stimulus would go away because that's what you wanted. However, one contraction does not eject a baby. So instead, what we see happening is the minute the uterine muscle contracts, it sends a stronger signal to the brain and the brain releases even more oxytocin. And the more oxytocin you release, the stronger the contractions become the closer together they become. And eventually you have just so much oxytocin and such strong contractions that we're gonna just say that the baby gently glides out of her, the mom. So congratulations. The third item of our unifying themes is phenotype, genotype, and our environment. And as I mentioned to you before, your genotype is basically the collection of your genome, so all the genes that you inherit from your parents, your chromosomes, and we're interested in seeing how this genetic makeup will contribute to your physical appearance, your behavioral concepts, and this would be all in our phenotype. And what we see happening is that oftentimes our end phenotype will be a combination of both the genotype as well as environmental factors. In fact, on the illustration that you see right here, we have our little Daphnia, which are little water fleas. And what we see happening is that we can go ahead and extract samples from the same species that have relatively the same amount of the same type of genotype. However, from a phenotypical aspect, they can be completely different depending on which environment they are reared in. The water flea on the left labeled A is the one that was uh, reared in an environment that did not have any predators. 
So this is the phenotype that develops when there are no predators around. The water flea on the right hand side, um, this one is reared in the presence of predators. And notice how from a phenotypical aspect, this one looks a lot more robust. It almost has like a helmet type shape. Um, and part of it is to make it look larger, to look like it can defend itself. And it turns out that regardless of the fact that both of them had the same genotype, it was the environmental factors, the fact that one had to grow up surrounded by predators that allowed for phenotypical plasticity to occur, which basically means that you can have one genotype that can generate multiple phenotypes because the environment plays such an important role in it. And even in humans, for instance, there's been lots of studies done where um, we, they would follow, for instance, twins, identical twins that maybe were placed up for adoption. And if the twins were separated at birth and reared by different families in different environments, when the twins come back together, it is very common to see things like height differences, um, differences in their hair color and their eye color. A lot of this can be corresponded to the amount of nutrients as well as the overall environment that they were reared in. So your genotype isn't the only thing that will determine your overall appearance. Your environment does play a significant role in it. And that's basically what this chart is meant to highlight. So your phenotype, yes, is all dependent on our overall genotype, what are the genes that we inherit? How are our cells working together? How do they form our tissues, our organs, and our organ system? But along the way, we also see that our evolutionary trait will come into play because what we have to think about is the fact that our environment will also control our overall developmental rate. And as the environment feeds into the system, not only are you able to have some plasticity, but it will also play a role in your reproduction success, whether this is at random or this is through natural selection. And all of this would cause us to have variations in our genomic setup, and not even accounting for things like mutations, but all in all, we do see that the DNA can start to be altered, especially if you do sexual reproduction and you create a hybrid with each offspring, thereby allowing us to track the changes in your DNA and follow the trend of evolution. Now, really quickly before we move on to our last item for our common themes, um, when you take a look at phenotypical plasticity, um, and we'll talk more about this as we start to, uh, start looking at our different chapters, you're going to notice that some of them can be reversible and some of them are irreversible. So for instance, in the case of our little water fleas, once they've developed into their adult form and they're either the ones that are nice i'm gonna call it nice and fluffy because he looks so cute look at his little belly the one that was reared without the predator or the one with the predator and more of a defensive helmet stand this is what we call polyphenism meaning that yes it has developmental plasticity but polyphenism basically says that once you reach your adult shape that is the form that you're going to maintain so we can't go from helmet to no helmet and from no helmet to helmet okay so that's what we've got. This is also what we see, for instance, in insects um, when they have different plasticity, when it comes to like differences in wing length or body uh, coloring, um, wing coloring, feather coloring. Um, this is also what we see, for instance, um, with alligators. We know that if we manipulate the temperature that the eggs are developed in, um, it can control which sex of alligator produces. The sex will not change once the eggs has hatched and the alligators are roaming around. So it's irreversible. Um, reversible phenotypes are when you take a look at things like acclimation and acclimatization. Acclimation is when you take a look at them under laboratory conditions. Acclimatization is more during natural environments. So for instance, let's say you were doing a study on fish and you want to figure out their metabolic rate, but you want to see if they're able to alter their metabolic rate depending on um, what season they're in. So is there a difference in the spring versus the summer versus the fall and the winter? You can go ahead and catch some of these fish and create an artificial environment in the lab and you know be able to adjust the temperatures in that. And when you see that you're doing acclimation, 
and their adjustment is usually reversible because as you change the temperature, they're going to adjust their metabolic rate and their heat production. Or you can go ahead and travel out in the field for every season and try to collect your samples that way. And if you're keeping it in its natural environment, then we're looking at acclimatization. So most of the time when you do your experiments on this end and you're just looking at a particular entity of the phenotype, so your um, digestive system, your metabolic rate, your heart rate, your blood pressure, the contraction and relaxation of your muscles, these tend to be reversible phenotypes that you're interested to see how the body adjusts as the environment changes, whether it's in a laboratory or in a natural environment. And our last concept is going to be the fact that one of the unifying themes that we encounter is that most of the time organisms will show a level of growth and development. And along the way, they're going to go ahead and have certain adaptations, um, which make them easier to adjust to their environment and can eventually lead to their overall success rate when it comes to reproduction. So this little um, chart right here, it just says diversity of anatomic and physiological strategies um, animals use to cope with their environment. And there's two different ways that they can kind of cope and adjust. One of them would be the proximal cause, which basically takes a look at the genes with the phenotypes and the environment. And then the ultimate cause would be if we were to do more of like a pedigree type of study where we want to take a look at evolutionary changes and if it was helpful to the organism to introduce these changes and if it allowed them to adapt at a better rate. So many of us, when we talked about evolution, we came across things like an evolution is um, the change in the genetic makeup of a population. And we see that this happens primarily because of sexual reproduction and the fact that you're able to mix and match genomes as you're creating a new offspring. But we also know that evolution will come into play um, when we take a look at things like natural selection. And natural selection basically says that our genotype gives us certain adaptations or inheritable traits that make us more favorable to the environment that we're in. And if we're able to adjust to the environment that we're in, that means like, for instance, with our little Adler snake right here, the camouflage of the scales is just a perfect adaptation for it, him to go ahead and just camouflage inside of his environment. And as he's hiding there, it makes it very easy for him to come across food. And as you can see right here, he's enjoying a delicious meal. Yum, yum. And what does this picture mean? Well, if it's easy for you to get food, that means you have lots of energy, which means that when it's time to find a mate, you have been termed a good uh, provider, which makes it more likely for you to mate and have high reproductive success. So natural selection, oftentimes people like to call it survival of the fittest, but natural selection basically says that on an innate level, we're programmed to find a mate that has the best adaptations to the environment that we're currently living with. And the reason you want to do that is because you want to take those genes that make your mate so adaptable and pass them on to your offspring. Is there such a thing as a perfect organism? No. And part of that is because our environment is consistently changing. So as our environment changes, the traits that make us favorable will have to adjust as well. And what we see happening is as favorable traits reverse back or they're no longer favorable and other traits become favorable, what we see happening is that the DNA or the genotype or the genetic makeup of the population starts to change to reflect the changes in the environment for one, but also things like mutations. And over time, the genome is different enough that you can go ahead and say that evolution has occurred. So you've had a change in the genetic makeup of your population. Now, not all evolution is due to natural selection and reproductive success. Um, what we do see happening is that there are items that can cause a random change in the frequency of certain genotypes within a population, and those will kind of fall into the category of genetic drift. Now, in genetic drift, we basically say that it's not necessarily the fittest that will survive, but at random, as for instance, the environment change, some might have just at randomly be spared, while others will perish. 
So for instance, at the bottom of the PowerPoint, I give you an example of the founder effect. The founder effect basically says that you can have um, migration patterns where a small part of the population will migrate over to a new environment. So as you can see right here, we have our little beetles and at random, one of them went ahead and migrated over to the island and it should really be two of them. But either way, um, on the island, what we see happening is that they're met with reproductive success and the population continues to grow. Now, if you were to come across this population, you would assume that all beetles were red and that all came from the same genotype. Whereas if we go back to our original population, you're going to notice that you also have the appearance of the yellow beetle. Now, where did the yellow go? Does it mean that the yellow wasn't as adaptable? No, not at all. It's just at random that the red genotype was the one that migrated over to the new property and allowed the development of a new species or subspecies to develop over there. It doesn't necessarily mean that it was the fittest that survived. We see the same thing in the bottleneck effect. So for instance, if something happens to a population um, that kills off a large quantity of it, um, maybe like a severe drought and there's severe famine, um, or there is, um, you know, like, a hurricane comes through and it kills off um, the majority of a population because they're not able to adapt to the stringent environment outside. What we see happening is that if you have a severe decrease in the numbers of one species, that is what we call a bottleneck effect. And the species that survive aren't always necessarily the fittest ones. They're just at randomly where the lucky ones that made it through the next effect. So just because we're looking at evolution doesn't necessarily mean that we always take a look at natural selections. There are lots of different ways that we can account for one DNA staying and changing while another one perishes. Now, as we come towards the end of our first presentation, something that I do want to highlight to you is, and I hope this makes sense, is that oftentimes when we start comparing different animal forms and functions, we're going to see that if they have an evolutionary ancestor, there will often be a lot more similarities that will come into play. Um, and then it'll also make it fun to kind of compare a closely related species to one that's a little bit more distant to kind of see how both of them were able to adapt and what type of physiological and anatomical changes can be contributed between them. Um, and at the end of the day, what we see happening is the more we understand where we came from and how we evolved, um, the better it's going to be to kind of explain our overall physiological processes as well as our diversities. All right, um, that is all I have for this particular chapter. So once again, um, I want to thank you for listening to my rambling. If you have any questions, comments, and concerns, please do not hesitate. Send me that email or utilize your discussion sessions. All right, um, hopefully we'll quote unquote talk soon, but if not, I'll definitely, you'll definitely be hearing me and my list for our next chapter, which will be chapter three.